my talk today is simply about cloud networking. And uh, specifically, what I'm going to do, I'm going to revisit some of the past experiences because I believe they are relevant uh, to provide um, um, a sound cloud networking solution. And um, I spent my last uh, six, eight months really focusing on development. So forgive me if I, I get a bit technical at times. So I want to start with a, a brief history of networking because I, I believe in the past it's hidden the future. Um, we started basically with isolated networking clusters. And um, you know, very fast we realized there is a need to interconnect them. So the internet was born. And um, then we got to VPNs. And I want to talk about virtual private network technology a little bit in one slide because I believe it, it's very similar with the network overlays, which are the hot subject in the cloud networking space these days. Um, then I wanted to touch briefly on the mobile data space uh, because it's about uh, a huge number of volatile uh, end devices which are attaching to the network. Uh, and uh, I believe there are important lessons to be learned from this uh, use case. And then I will talk a little bit about uh, the AWS trend. Now we'll wrap it into um, how networking, uh, cloud networking specifically, could be affected by these experiences. So again, the internet, it's really about a federation of networking clusters, interconnected. And um, basically, what allowed us to interconnect those clusters and steer traffic between clusters was the IP routing protocols. And specifically, BGP is what actually allowed the dissemination of information between networking clusters. Its border gateway protocol was done for this sort of stuff. Now, if you look at virtual private networks, the virtual network domain provided by one physical infrastructure are very similar with the virtual uh, containers, virtual application containers in the cloud networking space. And um, uh, we got basically, I think, in my previous job, we, we got to about a quarter million devices running VPNs, and there are probably millions of those devices deployed all over the place. In the current form format, it's very, very similar with the network overlays, right? And uh, people are talking a lot about network virtualization in the data plane, encapsulation, so on and so forth. Uh, that's the simplest uh, component of the VPNs, actually. Uh, isolating the packet forwarding in the data plane was done a long time ago. Um, it's not a problem. And also, people are talking about underlay awareness, like it's a big issue. Uh, in VPNs, we actually had to solve that, that issue, and we addressed it with a number of tools. I think the most important development in around 2000 was the introduction of BGP multi-protocol extensions. Before then, we tried to do with uh, virtual routers a number of virtualization uh, solutions. And they involved all of them deploying one uh, routing session per virtual network domain. And they failed miserably because it doesn't scale operationally. It's impossible to do it, right? Um, then BGPMP came on board and was developed in ITF to actually be able to have one session, one control plane session, programming the data plane forwarding for all of these virtual network domains. This is what actually got deployed and is working today. So now if we go back to the mobile uh, data, right? What you have in there, you have a number of mobile devices uh, that could move between different network attachment points. It's a huge number you can have in there. You can start small, but it's usually millions of them, right? And uh, it's a user-driven connectivity. So everybody has basically a cellular phone. You just turn it on and it connects to the network and you start getting data on your device. This was enabled, um, again, by user-driven connectivity mechanism, but more importantly, by a centralized policy module that is under the control of network admin, where you can go in there and you can provision per user profiles, right? And uh, then those profiles are automatically assigned by, by this module. More importantly, overall, um, it provided the first instantiation of a self-serve self network. I mean, you guys have, all of you, probably a mobile device or new right now. I bet that in the room here, nobody knows what PCRF terminology or SGI or GTP means. I will put $100 on that if somebody. All of them? Say it. It's written on your side. Oh, shoot. <laughs> that doesn't count then. OK, that doesn't count. If you work on LTE, that doesn't count. 
Uh, thanks for being honest with me. But I will take you for a beer after that. Um, so basically, um, everything is hidden. The network complexity is hidden from the end user. You just turn on the phone, everything gets instantiated. You have no clue about all of these protocols. I run away from LTE because there are so many of them. So now, the other important lesson is what I call the AWS effect. Basically, uh, I put here a mobile uh, application that is running on a mobile device, right? Which allows you to check all the um, compute instances, what they are doing in AWS. So Amazon Web Services introduced this uh, easy to use service development and service consumption model, where you can go on a web interface, uh, on a mobile application, and um, uh, use also simple APIs to basically order, consume, and monitor your, um, your compute and storage services. This basically created a whole discussion about cloud networking, where the networking has to fit in. You have to have zero touch instantiation uh, in the network. You have to hide the complexity of the networking. And uh, you have to accommodate a large number of compute nodes that come up and down all over the place. They might be moving between different network attachment points, the same like in mobile networks. So it's basically about a self-serving uh, network. Also, it's not just about layer two. The enterprise topology is, the usual enterprise topology is much more complex. This is the reality. What you have in there, you have basically a multi-tier service topology where you can have multiple application containers uh, located in different security domains. And um, the networking in the middle has to provide L2, L3 uh, networking, maybe L4, L7 ACLs. And you might need to actually mix up in their appliances to steer the traffic between these application containers and isolate them in the same time from the public domain and in between themselves. So I wanted to right now start talking about what that means for the cloud networking space. And I want to talk about the importance of abstractions, which I think it's uh, essential to the new space. If you look basically um, uh, into the network, you cannot go and ask the, the user to actually provision routing protocols or networking protocols of any sort, the end user, if you want to fit in with your networking. They, don't, they shouldn't be aware about the networking topology. And I think there is a lot of uh, progress that was made, but even in AWS, there are some services where there is heavy configuration of protocols in there. So it's important to provide familiar abstraction to the user. And I'm giving you an example of what I mean by that. Here I'm showing two application containers. Let's say this is web services and the other one is business logic. And they have to be exposed, the, the services they run, they have to be exposed to the public internet or to the enterprise VPNs using basically different abstractions and different policies between, uh, between them implemented by the networking. So basically, it is about a simple service development and service consumption model. And I'll give you an example. The admin has to be able to go there and develop different service templates in a controlled fashion. And then the user just needs to come and consume them easily using uh, simple northbound APIs or the cloud management system they are used with. More importantly, there has to be a capacity to enforce the compliance of the policy and monitor the compliance. I talked to some enterprise IT guys and they spend uh, millions of dollars to actually go through a very complex process to do this uh, compliance enforcement. So it's important to simplify that and provide control to the CIOs. Um, and I think you know, that means also being able to control what templates are exposed to which user groups. So now I wanted to go a little bit under the hood of the cloud networking engine and uh, look, look in there at uh, the major components I believe need to be in place. So as we learn from the internet, it's not just about one data center cluster. Uh, it's not about one controller or a controller group dealing with virtual domains just in one cluster. You can start with one cluster, but as we learn from the internet, it's always going to, to be about expanding the virtual network domains across those clusters. So how do we do that automatically, right? So in the VPN case, what work 
perfectly for these virtual network domains was actually using multi-protocol BGP. You basically put uh, a multi-protocol BGP federation in place and the virtual network domains are expanded automatically across multi-DC uh, clusters. More importantly, because everything in the wide area network, the internet, the VPNs are about BGP and multi-protocol BGP, you can distribute those data center clusters around a wide area network, right? So basically, if you put in place multi-protocol BGP federation, you can make the DC clusters talk between each other, even if they are located geographically uh, in different locations. And you can also make them appear to the wide area network routers the way I'm showing it in there. They just appear, every cluster is just an individual uh, router to them. They don't know they are talking to cloud networking um, entities. And those virtual network domains expand uh, automatically across basically data center between clusters and to enterprise sites. So it fits with the overall networking model we developed for uh, the last 20 years. So underlay awareness, this is like a big debate going on between you know, two different companies. It's a big issue, they say. It's not a big issue. We actually, in the VPNs, we already addressed that. The best way to do it is to make the controller aware about what's going on in the IP underlay, in the physical network. Track the events. And there are mechanisms like next stop tracking, which allows you to know right away when there is a failure. And then the BGP uh, component or the controller can react in the local domain or across clusters and reshape the service overlay. Uh, of course, it's always also about visualization. So you have to have an application or a, a management console that logs the events and allows you to correlate uh, the alarms across overlay and underlay. So now, I think the policy management, although I left it at the end, is very important. You need to decouple the module from the controllers. It has to be centralized because um, basically it has to provide the control to the IT security and networking admins. You have to basically be able to go in there and develop templates and then assign them to the users in a control fashion based on the user hierarchy or grouping. And we know basically that uh, this kind of model provides easy to use uh, compliance monitoring and enforcement. This model also scales, can start small and can scale basically to uh, millions of uh, virtual machines. And they, it allows also the virtual machines to move between cluster. Inside the cluster, basically it removes the connectivity from where it is and reshapes the connectivity into the new location. You know, the policy module does that automatically. And MPBGP takes care of disseminating the information if the VM moves between clusters. So in summary, I think abstractions and templates are cool and actually emulate very close uh, the uh, AWS uh, model, the service consumption model. I also believe when it comes to the networking engine, it's important to reuse uh, what we learned from the past and avoid the errors we made in the past. So, you know, we, we could provide virtual network domains that span multiple clusters and the wide area network, and the building blocks will be, yeah, network virtualization, but definitely underlay awareness and multi-protocol BGP. And when it comes to instantiating networking and moving networking around for many volatile endpoints, right, we know that user-driven connectivity and centralized policy module enables that and allows compliance enforcement and monitoring basically saving the cost of errors and the loss of business, and also allowing us to include in their service development model, which is providing service velocity, increased service velocity, and increases also the end user consumption of networking services. So that's what I had to, uh, uh, to talk about today, and I want to open it up for questions. So uh, it's interesting you mentioned VPNs. Uh, one of the great benefits of VPNs is you can have many different vendors, uh, you know, at the endpoint. So uh -huh. one, vendor A over here and vendor B over there. But because there's protocol standards, you can make these VPN work together over different vendors' products. Uh -huh. Do you see the same thing happening with these new uh, network engines you're talking about? 
Yeah, so the question wa was, was basically more a statement. VPNs had to interoperate between multiple vendors. And do I see the same thing happening between all of these networking entities that have to be connected together? Definitely, you know, it will end up being about uh, connecting all of these clusters together and possibly being able to avoid vendor lock-in and interconnect those clusters even if they are belonging to multiple vendors. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in the VPN, it took actually a long time and was very painful to make it interop, right? Um, so especially, I mean, there were three major vendors who participated initially in the development. Even for these three vendors, it took us probably about five years to make it work. But, you know, MPBGP and what we have right now implemented actually interoperates between, between all uh, vendors of VPN, in the VPN space. So I think instead of trying to go through the same process, which was very painful, at least for me, from a development perspective, I think we should reuse what we came from here and what works well. So that's why I'm saying MPBGP probably is the best way to disseminate the information. The encapsulation actually are not a big deal. You know, right now there are probably two, two encapsulations. You can deal with that easily. Even in VPN, we had GRE encapsulation, which was IP-based, and um, some variation on the MPLS. And we made it work easily. The control plane, I think, is the big problem. Did I answer a question? Uh, you were, yes, but now there's more questions, but we'll talk about it later. <laughs> I'll give you another chance where we can talk. <laughs> so, any other questions? I actually have a question. Go ahead. So, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of Layer 3. I mean, I love Layer 2, don't get me wrong, but I'm also a fan of Layer 3. So, so one of the questions that I have is, um, you know, one, and, and I've seen your demo, so I, I'll admit I've also seen some, so, so a little bit more, but could you maybe explain a little bit about the value of connecting the WAN to the data center? and sort of the value of, of tying that together from a, from a software-defined networking and a software-defined data center perspective. Yeah, so I think uh, when it comes to actually tying the WAN, it's also um, about making it easy to consume those services. So you have interconnect between uh, DC clusters, that's important. But at the end, the user is not in the data center. The end user is actually in the wide area network. And if you go through a gateway, which is not part of the information dissemination from the automation component, then you have a problem because you're stuck in a step where you have to go back to VLANs or go back to uh, a provisioning mode to disseminate information, right? If you put multi-protocol BGP in there, it has auto-discovery included. We work on that for a long time. So it programs the tunnels, it programs the routes into the tunnels. L2, L3, it even have, has the capability to provision flows. Right and map them. So it is very important, in my opinion. You have to be able to consume uh, the service that the data center is offering. Excellent, excellent. Um, one more last call for questions before we uh, we move on. Any other questions? All right, Florin, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you.